Hi everyone, welcome back to another virtual farm tour here at Chatsworth Farm. I am joined by our lovely Tom Turkey over here. It's kind of fitting for Thanksgiving, which is coming right around the corner. Um, but I'll actually talk about him a little bit because a lot of people ask that question whether or not he is going to be destined for Thanksgiving, but he's actually not. He is our um, Ridley Bronze Tom, and as you can see at the back of his tail right now, he has a little bit of a an oddly shaped tail uh, since he's molting, so that means he has lost all of his old feathers and he's starting to uh, regrow them so once they've reached their full length you'll have a beautiful full tail at the back and the reason he is not going to be used for um, any Thanksgiving table is because he is one of our breeding stock males so I only have the one adult Tom right now and that's this guy right here so once I have the younger ones that are um, of maturity next spring um, hopefully I'll be able to breed them and get some turkey poults so we can raise turkeys ourselves rather than getting them from a hatchery so right now he's kind of stopped a little bit but he was displaying or showing off and so this is what they do for the females they'll really puff out they'll put their wing feathers on the ground and they'll drag them along the the ground and they make a, a noise and then he'll make a, a quite unique sound it might be a little bit difficult to hear uh, today because we have all the geese in the background but he's really he's really lovely and you can see on his feathers um, that he has this iridescent tinge to them so you've got some really nice blues and greens and purples and bronzes in that color so a lot of turkeys and especially any male birds so any male chickens or ducks or turkeys will have iridescent feathers so that's just a characteristic of male animals geese typically don't so you can see the the geese in the background the males and the females pretty much pretty much look identical but it just kind of varies on the breed so we got quite a lot of uh action going on today for me it's quite loud i don't know what it sounds like to anyone watching but while i'm sitting here uh it's almost hard to hear yourself think when you have the geese in the background so all those geese at the back, those are the mature ones um, and one of the older goslings that hatched out earlier this spring. And then we have three over here that hatched out a little bit later. So they pretty much are full grown, but you can tell that they're still younger because they have, uh, their bills aren't still as bright orange. And then they're just a little bit smaller in size and they're still a little bit fuzzy when you look really closely. They still have some of their down showing. And we have the rest of the ducks. And then the chickens are in the, the background a little bit more. So we have all of the animals are out and enjoying the last of the fairly nice weather. We've had really fantastic um, weather for harvest this year. So everything is going quite well. And right now at the moment too, even though there are no chickens right here at this time, they are going through uh, their molt. So that means that they're losing their feathers, their old feathers, just like the turkey is, and regrowing their new ones. So they've stopped, uh, some of them have stopped laying eggs or they've really slowed down. So I'm getting uh, maybe five, five eggs a day or so from about 30 hens. So once they regrow their feathers and they're finished with their molts, they'll uh, begin laying again. Molting takes a lot of energy and a lot of nutrients and so do laying eggs. So they can kind of only do one thing at a time. So right now they're focusing on their molting, which they typically do in the winter or in the fall leading up to the winter. And then this chick right here at the front, this is one of the sapphire chicks uh, that hatched out this spring. I think this one was hatched in June. It's getting hard to remember which ones were hatched when. But so this one likely will be a pullet, so a young female. It's quite hard to tell at the beginning 
because chickens are a little bit more difficult to sex than mammals are. So you kind of have to wait until all their, their feathers come in and they start to get a little bit bigger and then you're able to tell whether you have a male or a female. But just by looking at this one, it's looking a little bit more petite and just overall more feminine. And that's the thing that um, when you think about animals, you might not overly think of them as either masculine or feminine. But when you're looking at animals and especially in the cattle world as well, when you take them to shows and you're talking about judging them, uh, if you're looking at a class of females or you're looking at a class of males, one of the words that will be used to describe them are masculine and feminine. So if you have a female, you want her to look very pretty, very feminine. And in a male, you want him to look fairly masculine. So um, even in, in chickens and uh, ducks and geese too, you kind of have those similar qualities. Some like the geese are a little bit harder to tell because they are so similar between the males and the females. But with chickens, you definitely have that more male looking than female. <laughs> mm. And we have the cats over here too. Um, I also had the eggs. So this is my egg um, collection from this morning. So not very many. But I still do have uh, my female duck laying eggs, which is kind of unusual. So the duck egg is the one on the right hand side and then the chicken egg is on the left. So I'll set them down. So they're right side. So side by side. So now the duck egg is on the left and the chicken egg is on the right. So it is, it doesn't really look like it's that much larger, but when you crack them open, the yolk itself on the duck egg is about half again as big as the chicken egg. And both duck and geese eggs are quite a bit more rich in their flavor and their coloring than chicken eggs are. It just goes with uh, waterfowl. And there's absolutely... Uh, other than the richer taste, you can still use them for baking. They're really good for making buns and cookies and things like that. So when we're not having our eggs hatch out, um, we take them and we use them for making lots of goodies for harvest. Since um, when everyone is out and about in the fields, they appreciate some cinnamon buns or cookies or brownies that they can snack on throughout the day. I don't have any goose eggs right now because they stop laying fairly early in the year once they've hatched out their goslings. And then just yesterday I moved my ducklings. So those ducklings that had hatched out a little while ago, I moved them into this bigger pen. And so now there are 13 ducklings total in here. So there are two hens, two mother hens that hatched out these ducklings. So there are three that are a little bit smaller and then the 10 are a little bit larger. So the three are from the later hatch. So you can hear the mothers clucking in a very specific way. So that's their mother, motherly clucking. Um, chickens will cluck normally when they don't have chicks or ducklings but then they all change the tone or the sound that they make once they have babies and it doesn't matter whether they have chicks actual chicken chicks or if they have ducklings um, they will make that same noise so ducklings grow quite a bit more quickly than chickens do these ducklings were hatched uh, three weeks ago now I think or around that time. And I have chicks that are almost uh, almost coming on two months and they're just about the size of these ducklings. So chickens take quite a bit more time to mature and develop, but ducks and goslings grow very quickly. So even though it's a little bit later in the season to be hatching out or raising younger birds, it's kind of good to do it with any kind of waterfowl because they do grow a little bit more quickly.
especially with ducks and geese, it's important to have a lot of water. If it was just hens and chicken chicks, uh, they would only need to have a little bit of water that they would go through throughout the day and it would stay quite clean. But because of the way the ducks feed, uh, they like to dabble in the water, then um, go get some food, bring that food back into the water and kind of mix it up and make it a little bit easier for them to digest. So they get their water quite a bit more uh, well used than chickens do. So we have to change the water a little bit more often. And of course, ducks love water. So they're just in there splashing around and enjoying the water too, rather than chickens just have water purely for the sake of being thirsty. So we're going to move on to the ducklings. So we are almost finished with harvest right now. We only have our oats to go. We've combined our wheat and our barley. So that's done. And Alex was in the um, truck this morning unloading that into the bin. So we're glad that we've had such good weather. Even with this year being as it has, one of the great things has been the harvest this fall. It has been going very well. So we're very thankful for that. And we only have our oats left. So they were greasing the swather this morning and getting ready to take it down to swath our oats. And then that'll be the last of our cereal grains. And then we have our corn that's going to be harvested hopefully next week. So we're going to have a crew come out and chop the corn for silage. So that's a big production. It's a, a busy day and maybe a bit depending on uh, the weather conditions and how fast they're able to do things pending no breakdowns. So we have that to look forward to and we'll get some videos of that. Lizzie's here with me. We have the kittens in the background, but I'm going to show you some of the chicks that are now, those are the, the month and almost two month old, not quite. They are in this building over here. So they're not quite old enough to go outside or big enough to go outside yet. If I were to give them another month, they would be good to be outside by themselves. But in here there are 35 and they're a mix of a bunch of different breeds. These are all the crossbreds. None of these are, are purebreds at all. And then in the back, um, there's some crates. They're empty. But that's, um, those crates are what I use for hatching out any of the chicks. So if I do have, kitty, out. If I do have any, uh, Lizzie, if I do have any hens that have gone broody and they've decided that they want to sit on eggs, I put them in the crates and it just keeps them isolated and keeps them in a safe space as well as just lets them be alone. So that's what I have in this one right now. So I have uh, one of the sapphire hens in here. So she's broody and she's sitting on some duck eggs and three chicken eggs. So they should be hatching out in the next week or so. So it just gives them a good spot to sit uh, on their eggs and not be interrupted by all these chicks in here. So I can kind of have different groups of animals together when they're in these crates, even though they're meant for dogs, but the dog has never once gone in the crates. They're all for chickens and ducks. Come on, Liz. So we have the kittens over here that are quite enjoying the longer, nice fall. Um, last year at this time we kind of had snow, so it was probably not so much fun for the kittens, but this year they're getting a little bit spoiled in the nice weather. We have, uh, most of our machinery brought back. Uh, we had some bales that we moved from a nearby field. So we we're using a loader to load those up and then we bring them home and we stack them in long rows, which are, uh, over on the other side of the yard. So we had 400 of them. So I gathered them up and I grouped them up into long rows on the field. And then Alexander uh, took the tractor and the semi truck and hauled them home. Sit. 
So there we have the, the swather uh, hooked up and ready to go. We have our other tractors that are lined up here in a row for quick and easy access for whenever we have to move them out. And then we're gonna go walk over and check on the uh, broilers that we have. They are going for processing on uh, Thursday. So that's gonna be our last batch. And then we're done for the, the year until next year. So we have the chickens and the turkeys. The turkeys are going to go a little bit later because they take longer for growing and we didn't get them until a little bit later in the spring than, than we had hoped just because there was such a huge demand for chickens and turkeys this spring that we got, got them when we got them. So uh, because today's a little bit overcast and chickens do really like nicer weather, they're inside a bit more today but they are outside and then we have their waterers are outside as well and then we have the tubs of grain here so we can easily feed them in the mornings so we'll feed them water them each morning um, they get fresh water and fresh grain same thing with all of the chickens and ducks and geese they are fed every morning and when it comes time to uh bring all the cattle back for the winter. They get the same treatment, they get fed. They do have automatic watering bowls, so we don't have to water them during the winter, uh, but we do have to keep an eye on them to make sure they don't freeze. But everything gets fed and watered in the morning and then are let out. So letting them out makes it a lot easier for us to uh, make sure that they have lots to eat because they're able to go around the yard and scratch around the dirt and pick up any weed seeds or, or grasses that they might find and so they really enjoy that and it just makes uh, their life quite a bit more enjoyable too. This is our alley so the pens on either side of me some of them have the bulls in them and then some of them you'll see little white dots and those are all the chickens everywhere but these pens are pretty empty during the summer and early fall and then they get filled up with cattle in the winter time so we'll have different groups in different places so we'll have our bulls we will have some of our heifers our steers our replacement heifers so everyone gets uh, a little bit of little bit of a different location as well as a different feeding program because the different animals take different kinds of minerals and different nutrients that they'll need since the uh, calves the calves that were born this spring will need different feeding requirements than their mothers who are going to be pregnant again and getting ready to have their calf in the spring so just making sure that everyone has the right quality of feed and big enough pens that they're able to uh, comfortably uh, lie down and spend time during the winter. So you can see the chickens are in here with the cattle. These are some of the purebreds or the recipient uh, mothers. So these cows have either been AI'd, use, so artificial insemination, or um, are recipients for embryo transfer. And then they're calves. And then some of these in here are heifers. So they will be first time mothers coming next spring. So they won't have any calves. So they're going to be the ones, they're going to be the really tall animals. Those are going to be your mature cows. Then you're going to be, have your medium-sized animals. Those are going to be the heifers. So like this one over here, so the bigger one of these two. And then you're going to have the small ones, so the calves that were born this spring. These cattle come back and forth between this pen, and then they can go out into the field, which is pretty much um, on the horizon just before the trees. So that was our green feed for our oats. So they're able to go in there, they clean up any of the grass along the edges, any of the um, regrowing oats, if there are any, or any of the stubble. So the stubble is uh, after the 
the crop has been cut, you're left with some of the stalk. So that's what stubble is called. So they'll clean that up for us. And then because the nutritional value in the leftover plant material on that field is decreasing, we are providing them with some hay bales. So that's what they're eating right now. And this is what the cattle will get all throughout the winter. So hay is dried grass, or in this case, it's alfalfa, so a dried legume. And we have it in one of these feeders. This feeder is has a skirt, it's called a skirt at the bottom. So some feeders will just be these bars all the way down, but we like to have a skirt on the bottom because as the cattle are eating, they like to pull the hay out and make a little bit of a mess. And so having the skirt on the bale feeder allows for the hay to stay contained within the feeder and uh, less, less waste. And we have the same thing for the sheep, just in miniature. Not much smaller, but a little bit, and the bars are spaced a little bit more closely together because the sheep have much smaller necks. So this feeder is one of the big ones. It's kind of an oval shape. And then we have another one, so very similar in design, but this one's just round and just holds one round bale. This is one of the um, one of our purebred Angus calves. So the out, any of our Angus cattle have the green tag. I know I've talked about tags a lot in my videos, but everyone always seems to be interested in that and what do they mean and what do the different colors uh, coordinate with. So this is one of our little bull calves so that means he will hopefully be used for breeding once he becomes old enough same with this guy so the blue tag indicates he's a male and then has his uh, his number and his mother's number on it and then the green tag is the same thing but the green tag just uh, shows us that he's a purebred black angus And you can see the corn in the background. So that's what's going to be silaged or cut for silage next week. So that'll be a really neat process to get some videos of and show you how that works. I wasn't around for silaging last year. So the first time we actually did it. So um, getting to see it on our farm is going to be something new for me as well. So that's going to be lots of fun. Not interested in turning his head. So the rest of our cattle are going to be coming back probably in the next uh, couple of weeks, depending on once we're done harvest and just wrapped up everything around the yard and get everything prepared here. So we will be taking our um, stock trailers that we just pull with our regular um, everyday trucks and then we have our semi truck and a cattle liner that we hook up and so we'll take that and we haul the cattle out so it's usually an all day uh, process depending on which field which field we're um, moving animals back and forth from but uh, it's always good to have them back before it snows because it makes it a lot easier for us and the trucks because once the trucks and the trailers are loaded down with so many animals, it can be really difficult to get out of the different pastures uh, if there does happen to be snow or any other moisture. It just makes it a lot more difficult. So when it's nice and dry is the perfect time to do that and we want to um, get them out and bring them home in good time before it starts to snow for those reasons. So I guess when I was talking about um, masculine versus feminine in the chickens, we talk about that in the cattle too, as I mentioned. So you can see that really well in this bull calf. So you can tell his face looks a little bit more male. 
And that might be something difficult to to see if you've never thought about cattle in that way. But we'll take a look at him and then we'll find one of the, the females, so one of the young heifers. So his face is just a little bit more bullish and that's what we want. We don't want him to have a huge head because when he, it, when he becomes a sire and if we decide to breed him to some other females... Uh, a calf having a really large head is not something you necessarily want because it makes for a really uh, hard birth. So we'll think about what he looks like. Um, even though these are all females, it's a little bit more difficult to compare because they're more mature. But we'll find a heifer like this one. So you can tell she's a heifer because she has uh, the yellow tag. So that's an easy, easy thing to look at. But then when we look at her face, she does look a little bit more um, neat in her top end. So a little bit more pretty. And these are all, a lot of these words are used in cattle judging. So they're clean on their front end or they're neatly put together. And if you're not used to those terms, um, they might sound a little odd, but this is also another one of the heifers, so you can see she just looks a little bit more uh, feminine and uh, more pretty, even though that's not really quite the proper word to use, but I think if you take a look at them and, and you kind of compare the difference between the, the heifer and the bull calf, you'll know what I mean. So the same thing with the cows. You want the cows to look quite feminine. They'll usually have a bit uh, smaller of a head than the bulls do. The bulls will look very masculine. It's something that's a little bit um, silly when you think about it at first, but once you see them, it, it starts to make sense. So this is another one of the heifers. Uh, and all of the ones, all of the heifers that we just looked at, those are all purebred black Angus. And then this uh, buckskin colored calf is out of one of the buckskin colored cows. So this one is not a purebred and it's also not a bull. This is a steer. And then his mother it is um, being used as one of the recipient cows. So her genetics aren't going to be passed on to the calf that she's carrying. It's been fertilized, the egg has been fertilized by another bull and the egg has been provided and flushed from another cow. So she's just the, the host. So she's the surrogate mother. But just like the chickens, even though the, the eggs are going to be, whether they're ducks given to chickens or chicks given to ducks, uh, they still take care of their babies as they were genetically related to them. It doesn't matter to them at all. They still have that bond with their uh, offspring. So in the springtime, hopefully we'll have some embry embryo transfer calves. So those are always really exciting. So this is uh, the, the female group with all the calves. So the bulls have been taken out. They were taken out earlier this summer. And then we have our bulls over here. And it's a lot easier to, to see what I mean when I say um, masculine in the bulls because they are so they are so big. So they have another bale in here in their bale feeder. And more chickens. These are all of our bulls minus a couple that are in the pen with the horse and the ram and a few of the other cows. So when we were looking at the cows, you could see that they had um, quite, quite narrow faces. But then when you look at the bulls, they're quite broad. And just a lot more power in them than the cows do. And that's what you want to see in your bulls. You want a lot of power. You want a lot of mass to them. But you don't want them to be overly chunky. Um, there are certain things that we look for in our bulls and that's that they have good feet and that they have good legs because as they're moving around the, 
pastures following the cows, you need a bull who is able to manage that very well. So feet and legs are really important in both bulls and cows. And then just their overall structure and how they're built. Um, so we want to look at their front end, make sure they're not too square or um, blocky. You want something that's quite smooth at the front end. So <laughs> Lizzie, get out of the way. And we have this, this one kitten um, seems to really enjoy following us wherever we go. It doesn't matter what tour we're on whether it's just me or if it's other other people here too this kitten enjoys following us around everywhere throughout the yard so it's quite funny this is the one of the black angus bulls most of the bulls in here are uh, we do have a hereford and we do have two simmentals so we have one black simmental who's in another pen and then we have this red Simmental. So one of the things that is quite interesting and on our first farm visit, I was talking to our visitors about that was just uh, the different colors in cattle because when each breed originated in their specific country of origin, so Simmentals in France, Charlais in France, Angus in uh, the UK, and other breeds, Herefords in the UK, other breeds throughout uh, Europe, each breed had a very distinct color pattern or coloring or size difference. So they were, they were quite unique and you would never mix up two breeds. But now because the Angus Association has done such a wonderful job of marketing Angus uh, beef to the world, a lot of breeds are now working to add black coloring or a black coat to their, to their breeds. So with this Simmental, he's red, but our other Simmental bull, he's black. And other breeds like Limousin, Speckle Park, even Herefords, breeds that are all very unique in their own coloring, now have different variations within that breed that have a black coat trait. So trying to match that trend of having animals that have a black coat because um, Black Angus is just such a, a well-renowned uh, breed for their beef, even though you can get into a whole conversation about which breed is better uh, beef-wise. Um, they're all quite similar um, at the end, but definitely the color choice has gone towards the black coat. So that's kind of an interesting thing where now, even though you might look at a herd of cattle in a pasture and they're all black, you can assume that they're only black Angus. They could be Maine Andrew, Simmental, Limousin, uh, Speckle Park, even Hereford. So that's one thing to kind of think about as an interesting, interesting thing about cattle. But all of the, the bulls in this pen that are black are black Angus. And then this is our biggest bull. This is our Hereford. So he weighs around 2,300 pounds. So Herefords are a breed that originated in Herefordshire in uh, England. And they're quite an old breed. And they're very distinctive. They have uh, uh, quite a bit of curls on their face and on their neck. And then you can get Herefords that are either polled, so no horns, or horned Herefords that have horns. So he's a polled uh, Hereford. All of our bulls are um, pulled. Some of them do have a gene that does throw um, horns, so horns can show up in some of their offspring, but it's just a genetic trait that's kind of hidden beneath the, the more dominant genes. Mm. 
So Lizzie's been quite busy with the, the last couple of nights. There have been coyotes that have been howling, so she's been um, very good at making sure they stay far away from the yard. Same with the deer. So if anyone has any questions about the the farm, please let me know. I feel like I've done a lot of the same things um, for the last couple of weeks because there hasn't really been too much turnover in what's new, even though we did have the ducklings, but I kind of covered the information about uh, hatching and chicks earlier with any of the chicks that were hatching. So I feel like I'm running out of things to talk about. So if uh, you have any questions or are particularly interested in seeing something, please let me know. Uh, we do have the corn. I could probably go take a walk out there. The bales are also out there so I can show you how we stack them, which is kind of interesting. And then you can see the difference between last year's bales and the bales from this year. As so you can see uh, the different color, how they weather over over a year i just have to walk through the gates some of them are easier to open with one hand than others come on this so i guess we have i'll do a bit of a, a an introduction about all of the animals here for anyone who might be new. We have a total head of 500 cattle. Most of them are commercial, so they're uh, mixed breeds. Uh, but we do have some Black Angus and some Simmental that are purebreds. Um, that's a herd that my brothers are doing, so they're working on adding different genetics to their herd using AI and embryo transfer. We have a small flock of sheep, so we have some Suffolk, Dorset, and South Down Cross. Our ram is a purebred Suffolk, and we have six ewes and 12 lambs were born this year, plus the addition of Rosie, who is a Mouflon American Black-Bellied Cross, and she is from our neighbors. So she's going to be going back soon uh back to his place so she can be with others of her same breed and the sheep are over here and this is the truck that we used to haul the bales home so the bales that are on the trailer right now are bales that broke um and these are the straw bales so straw is very light and fluffy and if you if I, because I was the one who did some of these, um, if you squeeze the bales a little bit too tightly, the mesh just starts to rip and the bales just kind of uh, ex explode almost. So they're very light and fluffy, so the straw kind of goes everywhere. So this isn't how we would normally haul regular nice bales that haven't had any uh, splitting happen. But we'll load them on there, two on the bottom on either side. So we are able to fit, we were taking 18, 18 in, or 24 in one load um, with these straw bales. And then we can haul a maximum of 34 when we stack them uh, two by two on each layer, on each row. And we'll usually do that for the hay bales when we're moving them from a field that's further away. And then we strap them down with these straw bales because they weren't going very far. We didn't strap them down and we only put a single row on the top. These are the sheep. Um, especially during the fall, it's quite nice to let them out because they can clean up all the grass around the yard. We don't have any... Uh, standing oats that they can get into because they really enjoy going into that field and um, nibbling a little bit on that. So during the fall is a good time for them to be out. They don't bother the corn at all and they can clean up all the weeds, all the grasses in here. So they're really good for uh, just keeping things tidy. 
you can see Rosie's kind of at the front, so she's the different colored one. All the sheep that have the black faces, those are the lambs that were born this spring. And then the females, the mature ewes, the mothers, are the ones that are just all white. And then Rosie's in the middle. Rosie. So there's Rosie. She's the Mouflon American Black Belly Cross. She is a hair sheep compared to the rest of the sheep, which are wool sheep. So she doesn't need to be sheared at all. Um, she's kind of naturally shedding like her, a dog would be, where the other wool sheep need to be sheared each year at least once a year. We have some more of our equipment um, back here, some of our discs and our harrows that we use for field work in the summer and then the fall are over here. And then I guess the last thing we'll take a look at today uh, are the stacks of bales, which go on for quite a while so I can show you the front um, the front side and how we stack them and these are just all of our straw bales so our hay bales are still um, on the field some of them have been brought home but the majority of them are still on uh, still on the alfalfa fields and have to be brought home so we kind of try to prioritize everything at different times of the year so what's important to do when so right now it's harvest and then also the straw bales needed to come off the neighbor's field because they wanted to heavy harrow it so we can kind of adjust our bale moving schedule because since it is a hay field and you don't uh, harrow it you want to keep the alfalfa intact and nice and uh, continue to grow so we don't have to worry about ours and we can kind of adjust things as needed so we're working on the harvest. We have the corn to silage and uh, various other things like the chickens to be processed. So never a dull moment. This is the corn over here. Um, as you go in a little bit further and as you move away from this side of the field, which is a little bit sandy, the corn gets quite a bit taller. But Lizzie doesn't mind. She quite enjoys running through that. So these are our straw bales. So all of the ones that are a little bit more bright in color, those are all the ones that were baled this year. And then you can see the, the color changes. They get a little bit more dull colored. So those are, uh, those are pea straw bales too. So they're not going to be as brightly color, colored anyway. Um, but they are from last year, so you can see they've they've just weathered a little bit more. So it's like having anything out in the sun in the rain. It kind of changes the, the color of that. So we have them stacked um, all the way from where our sheet pen begins all the way to the edge of the road. So pretty much as far as you can almost see, that's where the bales are, and it's a continuous row. So this will help us in the winter when we have the cattle in this field over here. It'll help to break the wind. So we do have uh, portable panels that we use for the cattle. But this just adds an extra um, element of wind suppression. So it really helps give them a nice break from the wind. And then we stack them. Uh, this row we stack them... Uh, just like this, just so we could make it to the edge of the edge of the fence because we uh, had taken all the bales off. But normally we'll stack them one at the top, two in the middle, and then two on the bottom standing on their ends. And stacking them this way allows the rain or snow to fall on the bales and then it kind of can run down the side and it won't sit in any pockets or it's um, more less likely to sit in any pockets of the bale so it can run off a little bit better and that prevents the bales from weathering as well. 
So that's all for today's tour. I'm hoping the next one we will have a little bit more of something different because I feel like I have talked about everything numerous times. Uh, so we will see you on our next tour, which is going to be um, a week from next Sunday. I might be doing some later in the afternoons after I get home from work. So we'll see how that goes. It gets a little bit tricky now because it is getting darker so much quickly, but I think it might be fun for anyone that has kids after school and they want to tune on and see some fun animals. So we're going to, um, I have to go get some water for the chickens, fill those up. So it's a little bit easier to feed them in the morning rather than hauling it from the hydrant. So I'm going to go do that. And then, um, some other cleanup around the yard while everyone else is going to go swathing. So thanks for tuning in and have a great Sunday. Bye.